Everyone's a racist. We know that to be true. And because of racism, we may get Major League Soccer in Arizona. Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. We'll talk about that. And we're also going to talk about simplistic math, how to manipulate your child or athlete to play differently through simple math. Just record. I'll show you what I did in the last six games with Jack to show how math will help. And that's all we're going to talk about on episode 554. Welcome to the Coach Cameron Soccer Podcast Experience. Is it experience? I don't know, but it's an experience for this poor guy. The reason I believe Major League Soccer will be in Phoenix, Arizona very, very soon is because of our beautiful haters on Twitter and everywhere else that want to f- want to find racism so badly that they're willing to punish everyone and destroy people just to make them bow down and think this is a good thing. This is not a good thing. And the reason I say it's not a good thing, we are so quickly quick to respond in such a way of you're a racist because he didn't he didn't agree with the movement. Everything he said in his statement he was frustrated that they would just not play. So he responded like he just doesn't understand the point of not playing. How does that solve racism? It doesn't. It doesn't. There's other ways of getting it done. By not having a platform of the sport you play, you're you're behaving stupidly. Then you have zero platform. Cuz just because you stop, it's not all it's doing is is inciting more hate and all that stuff. There's ways to solve it. It's not the only way of doing it, of not playing. So th- that's kind of how he came off. But the Real Salt Lake owner to sell soccer teams amid reports of racism. A court of reports. And you'll find no details, by the way, in any article how this man's a racist. He disagreed what they did to him and the soccer community that was excited about having people in the stands once again. Soccer had a chance to give back the community some sense of uh, normality. But that's not in any of the players' thinking. The players in the NWSL, Major League uh, Soccer, whatever, their primary focus, not all of them, but the ones that are controlling everything, because the ones that can't say anything, because I know if I was a player, and I was in that situation, and I don't want to lose my spot on the team or anything. You can't say anything. You just you're like, okay, okay, okay. I'll I'll, I'll do whatever. I just want to play soccer, uh, kind of thing. It's it's not a good. It this is fascist fascism. These are fascists forcing control of thought and actions, because if you don't agree to the way they they tell you to uh, agree, you're a racist. And they're dig until they find it. First, they'll call you a racist and a fascist. And then um, they will then go find it and, or lie about it. That's what's happening. Oh, no, that's not what's happening. Everyone, it, there's systemic racism, uh, racism everywhere, and especially this, this white, rich man. Of course. That's how it's being played. There's no logic or, or uh, data anyone's following on anything they're doing. Just everyone's a racist and we're going to burn everything down to the ground and and cause fights because this is the best way of doing it. Inciting anger. That's that's what's going on. So and and what's frustrating about this? I don't have the facts because the media is not giving the facts. He didn't support it. He was frustrated. He he thinks differently like he thinks differently like on how to solve problems. There's a reason he's a billionaire. He thinks differently, probably smarter than most of us because he can think and he's thinking now that he's being attacked, that it won't end because he he reads trends. He knows the trend. He knows he's screwed and he's getting out. And guess what? They're going to keep, they're going to keep coming. So you need to hide away for a year, which you can, because you're a billionaire and then come back. Um, Real Salt Lake owner, Del Loy Hansen will sell his soccer teams in the wake of reports that the media are, that he made racist comments. Major League Soccer said Sunday. Hanson's Utah soccer holdings include his MLS club, the Utah Royals of the National Women's Soccer League, and the, and the USL Real Monarchs. This bothers me because 
he, this man who put money in all these programs helped a lot of Arizona kids out that played with Real Monarchs. Now they're all in jeopardy of even having a program because this guy went over and beyond. He didn't have to do all this. And, and it's frustrating that we don't understand. Oh, don't worry. J.J. Watts is going to he, he's gonna, he's gonna buy it. We're, we're saved. Shut up. Okay, we'll see. MLS Commissioner Don Garber announced Hansen's decision. Both MLS and the NWSL had said they were investigating Hansen's after a report on Friday in the Atlantic quoted for former employees and others who said Hansen had made racist statements and used a racial slur. We, what are those statements and what's a slur? They'll never tell you. They won't. The Salt Lake Tribune also reported a, uh, on comments made by Hansen, who took a leave of absence amid the investigations. Shortly after the MLS announced, Hansen apologized in a written statement. So this is what you got to do. You got to apologize and bow down. And guess what? It won't be good enough because you're still going to get destroyed because you're forever, never forgiven. Ever. Because th that's that's what life's about. It's never forgiving. Because we're, we're, everyone on the BLM movement and all, everyone over there, they're perfect human beings. Never did anything wrong. Never set, said anything wrong. Uh, but we're perfect. So they're okay about making mistakes because they're, they're always going to be perfect. They're, they're clean. They can do whatever they want. They can murder someone as long as it's a Trumper. Uh, they can do whatever they want, and it's okay. Here's his apology. I recognize that at times I have spoken too quickly without pausing to consider the feelings of good intentions of others. This is not acceptable, and I— Assume full responsibility for allowing my words to travel unfiltered as to their significance and impact, he wrote. I believe that the communities are strengthened by diversity. I am truly sorry for offending and being insensitive to the plight of others. That's him with the statement following get out of this mess and just get out. I mean, he's just going to go quiet. I mean, th that sounds like a racist to me. You know, that... It just sounds like a man that wants to make change and help, and it just happened to be soccer, and it, now he's just he's just going to move on to his next thing. I mean, it's it's truly sad and scary. So, um, I want to get on to his statement. So here's a statement. I'm still trying to find out how this blows up to be something that is so racist. Let me get it for you so you can see it while I'm reading it. Um, it says, it's like someone stabbed you and then you're trying to figure out a way to pull the knife out and move forward. That's what it feels like. The disrespect was profound to me personally. Hanson said Thursday morning on the Salt Lake City ra radio station he owns. So he's frustrated that they would not play and he did all these things to make it happen and put time and money. And, and he's thinking about people that were going to work finally and get out of that, uh, th that situation and actually make some money. And, and, and I get what a lot of people are saying. Oh, he's a billionaire. She just give him money. Well, that's not how the world works. That's, I know that's how you want the world to work for the ones that are making stupid comments like that. Um, and it, they had an opportunity to, to have 5,000 people in a game, 5,000 people, uh, to experience normalcy as we've been shut down four months going on five months right now. You know, he just thinks differently like I would think differently. There's a time and a place. You you have an opportunity, uh, you soccer players, professional athletes, you have an opportunity to give. Give us our sport so we can actually be part of something. But what you did is pissed off so many people because they think differently. We're all on the same page. We want, we want, we want change in uh, police reform and all. It, w I agree. I'm white and I've had run in with officers. I can't imagine being black and dealing with what they have to deal with. Yeah, there's problems. And it's not, it's not from police officers being racist. It's from them having to apply the law that was given to him by our Congress and Senate, our government. That's what they do. They follow the orders of that. And, and I don't want to discuss it. There's problems, obviously. But not playing soccer is, oh, we'll fix it. We know how to fix it. It's not, it's not good enough that we took a knee, um, which I find annoying. It's lazy. 
at this point, it's lazy. Do something. Do something. Go to your community. Uh, uh, do you know this is one one thing I'll give to Mega Rapina, which I don't agree with ninety nine percent of the things she does. At least she's active, trying to uh, get people elected that think like her and stuff like that. At least she's trying to do something. I have more respect for her than everyone else that just fo- just followers doing nothing. Mega Rapino has the ability to to make change according to what her beliefs are, because she has the platform of soccer. You imagine if she just sat out the World Cup and wasn't the MVP of the World Cup because you know she, she uh, systemic racism. She would have lost her platform. She would have no voice right now. So what you guys are doing makes no sense to me. There's another way. Is it okay to think that there's another way? And you, you devastated the ratings and people are not going to want to go. Oh, we don't want those people to go then. Why can't we think differently and still get the same outcome? Obviously, what we're doing with rioting, uh, marching, that turn into riots and all this stuff is creating more divide. This is not helping. Of course, I'm a nobody, and I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, Yeah, so this might, this could come to Arizona. So I'm going to change my thoughts of, like, this is a horrible thing they did, but it actually might benefit my community in Arizona and the kids that in Arizona might get more opportunity because this whole thing can move to Arizona. It totally could. There's money behind the rising and they have an opportunity to stop waiting to get in the MLS, stop proving themselves and continually getting screwed by the MLS by just buying it. I don't know the rules on how to buy and all that stuff, but you can buy the franchise and you can move it. You can buy it, moved it uh, to Phoenix, Arizona, and hopefully they're having those talks. Arizona would love to have Major League Soccer. We would love to take take the um, the Real, move them to Arizona, call them Rising, and we'll save Utah from all their racism because Utah is obviously racist. There are a bunch of white people over there. There's just too many white people and white owners. Let's get them to Arizona. We'll take them. That would be amazing. Uh, I would be very excited about that. Arizona could have the next Major League Soccer franchise because of Twitter and people uh, calling the owner racist for disagreeing with how they get things done. Um, Yeah, so good news for us, maybe. Hopefully we can get it. That'd be amazing. Uh, So we're going to talk about the the importance of math. I'm going to show you the math I gave for Jack, but before we do that, we have to understand where our problems are with U.S. soccer. U.S. soccer has a big problem. We don't develop center mids. We don't, I'm mean, not on the uh, the world level, the world stage. We don't have center mids. We don't produce Martas. We don't even in the women's profession, uh, our our national team for the women's side, we don't have Martas. Brazil has a lot of them. We don't have any. You know, Rosa Lavelle, she's probably the closest thing we have. But we do not have technical players. We have big, athletic, untechnical players. And when I say untechnical, not technical like the rest of the world, the rest of the world produces it. Why? And I think it's a lot to do with what they're allowed to do and what they promote. It's cultural. What What is allowed to do? What What can you do? What do they cheer I think in Brazil and in Spain and in Germany, I, th- I think in the playing countries where they play on the streets, they appreciate technical play. We do not. We appreciate one, two touch soccer. That's what we do in U.S. soccer. And obviously it's wrong because we're not producing players. It's, it's, it's our, it's our DA, XDA. It's now the MLS Academy. It's all the pay to play soccer clubs that, you know, send kids D1 and all over the, all over the country. They're the problem. They have to be. They're the ones in charge, right? It's a problem. But I have good news for you. You can fix this as a parent, as a coach, as a director by focusing on math. Develop everyone. Focus on each individual by inviting parents to get data. Whatever data you want, just have them get it. So here's Jack's data. I'm trying to create a player in my home 
using data. So the last six games he had, which he had six games in literally seven days. Oh my gosh, too much soccer. No, it's not. It's a math game. I always report the score like I do because I want to know how difficult the match was. There's one game they won 4-0 and the team just packed it in. It's, it's, it's math, but you have to understand how easy it was for him. So in his all his games, he had 221 touches in a game, which a 36.83 um, touch average. So touching the ball, that's, that's a significant amount. And it'd be nice to compare with others, but I want to compare this over time for Jack because he we're in a big race to get as many touches in a game as possible. His forward passes of all games, he had 45 forward passes, a 7.5 average. And then he had, uh, of those 45, um, oh, excuse me, 45 successful passes, 18 were unsuccessful. So he had 7.5 success passing the ball forward and then an average of three bad passes per game. And then going backwards, he had 28 successful passes going backwards and three failures going um, backwards which that's a big deal because you're passing backwards and it gets intercepted. That's a big time counterattack. Um, so his average was 4.66 4. average passing the ball successfully backwards and um, a 0. 0.5 uh, per game average of passing the ball and be intercepted going backwards. His um, average touch rate was 2.33. And uh, he had takeaways. He had 25 takeaways taking the ball, whether it was intercepted pass or off the dribble, which was 4.167 per game. And assist takeaways were, I I added that because he would work hard to double team because he wanted the stats of takeaways. So I started giving him those hustle plays. He got 13, so it was 2.16 per game. And then um, I gave him uh, another hustle play where he would sprint 10 yards uh, defensively, not offensively. And he uh, he did that 0.33 of the time. So I'm just giving him data, and now we can have a conversation. We can have a conversation uh, at home. We can uh, really have these discussions in the car saying, hey, all right, you, you've you had 221 touches. You're 800 away from the 1,000 uh, touch club. Or you've had 45 successful passes going forward. So now I can say, hey, uh, soon – your goal is to get a thousand and this is your reward, whether it's a t-shirt or whatever. I want my son passing forward and less backwards because the best players in the world are able to receive the ball or identify passive going forward. The best players in the world find a way to be direct because the rules in soccer from our licensing says, um, every time you get the ball, can you score? If you can't score, can you get it to someone that can score? And the third is, all right, now keep possession. That's what we learn. But we don't teach that at all. We talk about it because that's what we do in life. If you say it, they'll give you your A license and then your super coach. And you can put on super tactical drills and realize you're part of the problem because you're not developing crap. Because you aren't. It's proven. We did not make the World Cup on the men's side. That's a big deal. How's that possible since we have pay to play everywhere and we put billions of dollars into it? So that makes no sense. We need data. If you have data, then, and this is what you can do with this data, parents, directors, you could go to your coach and say, hey, this child average uh, touches in a game is, is 0.5. Are they not playing? Oh, wait, I can see here. They're playing a, played 45 minutes in the last four months or whatever it is. You, you have data. You know your child cannot improve if they're not getting reps in the game, good reps where they actually have thought, clarity, because you have to be able to think on your own. You can't depend on a coach that's telling you everything to do because those coaches are part of the problem. We, they, they, they're more worried about winning that game in that moment versus giving kids an opportunity to think. That's what matters. That's what I stress. That's the change we need. We need to focus on the individual. We need to focus on individual opportunity and the simple math, as simplistic as you want to make it to give you the chance to do things. Compare time over success rate or whatever. You, you need to have a conversation with your coach and say, 
uh, my son has had a total of 200 minutes of playing this month, which might seem like a lot, but he's only had a total of 37 touches, which is an average of whatever, whatever that comes out to. And he's only uh, had 12 successful passes um, out of 17 opportunities. While so-and-so is getting the ball all day long. It, data matters. And if you can't get the math, like I, I'm like panicking. Jack doesn't have practice tonight, so I'm, I'm trying to find him a 6v6 match uh, with adults. He needs touches, and I'm going to record that too, and I'm going to put it in, in his, his data chart. He needs to play. He needs the repetition. You have to get that. Now, the one thing, uh, my, my son's playing the sixth position. I need him to play other positions. Left back, up front, whatever, 9, 10, 8. He needs to play uh, more positions. He needs to score more. He needs to be able to go forward and combine. He, he's very good at playing the six and mo- switching the point of attack, makes the team better and, and a better opportunity to win or whatever. He needs to experience different things. You can't just be one position ever in youth soccer. I don't care what age, but that's what happens. But if you build technical players based on math, and you can, it's not that difficult. I've done it. I've proven it. I've taken average players and put them in this environment where they gain confidence, they became better players, and, and progress through university, D1, you name it. I've done it with one team. It, it can be done. It can be done. So that, that's all I have for today. Thank you, uh, Outrage World, for destroying that poor, uh, <laughs> poor billionaire in Salt Lake. He's a racist. We have no proof. You know, because th- you don't need burden of proof or anything anymore. We know what he's thinking up here, and he's white. So he's a racist. He's done. And Arizona m- might benefit off it. So I'm excited about that. All right. I am out of here. I'm going to put that, the music on to let you know I'm out. But I'll be back. Maybe. No, I think I will. 6 p.m. I'm going to launch my podcast every night, 6 p.m. Arizona time, which is Mountain Standard. And I'll be back with more information on tomorrow to find out who's the next racist. It might be me. I don't know what I said. I I could be a racist right now, and people are going to dig into my life. You know, that's how we roll in this country right now. Everyone's a racist. Peace.